verse, uh, but again, I will try to tell the story uh, at, a, at a reasonable pace. I'm also very comfortable being in the dark uh, over here because it is a story about the dark sides of participation. And my little droopy is standing there being very happy. And if you don't know this cartoon, you should most definitely look for it because he's a, a cartoon character that knows how to say this magical sentence, I'm so happy, in the most depressing way ever. Have a look for him. Uh, of course, the reason why he's happy in a contemporary society is because he got a computer. And this is, in a way, indicative in uh, the approaches that in contemporary uh, culture we think about new media. They make us happy. They provide us with all sorts of joy. Now, I think that what we've heard so far are a series of, of analysis and talks that don't fall into this trap. Uh, I think all of the speakers are actually not part of this utopian uh, discourse, but we do see this kind of discourse circulate in society. Now, the talk I want to have here is very simply about this one word, about participation and what it is. And I want to look at the one word which I think is behind it, and that is power. And so I want to shift from a talk on participation to a discussion on power and how we can use that concept to look at online participation. Well, this is my self-promotional slide. I always used to put up the books that I'm talking about at the end of the presentation. I always forgot to show that. So now I've put it actually at the very beginning. If you're interested, have a look. It's medium participation. And this is a, uh, a special issue of a, uh, a journal uh, that's actually online, available for free. If you just Google my name, Media and Participation and CM, uh, you will find it. Uh, so actually, we can all go home and, or just go to the debate and read all the stuff and forget about it. But as I'm here, I want to make a couple of points, nevertheless summarizing uh, the stuff that's in there and trying to add a couple of new dimensions to it uh, as well. There's one very simple idea. If we talk about participation, uh, we talk about a concept which is in itself ideological. It's not a scientific academic concept that is untouchable. It's part of the societal struggle itself. And there are many, many different ways of dealing with this concept. And that way of these ways of, of dealing with the concept are political, ideological themselves. There's no escape to politics and ideology. Now, there are a group of people that have actually regretted that this kind of fluidity in the meaning of the concept of participation has occurred. And Carol Pateman, and this is 1970, already lamented that the widespread use of the term has created loss of meaning. And a number of people like her have tried to save the meaning of participation, the real meaning of participation, the authentic meaning of participation, and that is by contrasting real participation with false participation, manipulated participation, inauthentic participation, whatever. There's another approach that I want to introduce to you, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, but that is the approach that is looking at participation as an ideological struggle itself. But I'll come back to that in a second. The first approach, trying to save the authentic meaning of participation, is to be found, and this is a classic, uh, if you're inter interested in spatial planning, um, Sherry Arenstein's ladder of participation is one of the ultimate definitions of participation, uh, distinguishing between what is at the top levels, good forms of participation, and which is at the, at the bottom, forms of non-participation, manipulation, uh, therapy, etc., etc. There is a distinction between good and bad forms of participation. It's an, an article which you will actually find online. It's called The Ladder of Participation. Have a look at it. It's a very interesting article describing these logics of participation. And you will find that kind of thinking in many other fields. This is a more updated version. It still has this notion of the ladder in there. And if I'm not going, well, my PowerPoint presentation, everybody has his own st style, right? Mine is more filmic, 
which means 24 slides per second. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> in, uh, in development, development theory, even, and I stress even, the World Bank has used these kinds of logics. Uh, I'm not that much of a World Bank fan for some strange reasons, but even in their case, you'll find in this report, uh, the participation source book, you'll find a wonderful development of this distinction of different faces, the distinction between good and bad forms of participation. You'll find it in the arts. This is a 1924 essay um, by uh, Moholy Naguib describing how theater should actually become more participatory, again using the very, very same logics. This is about children and participation and the ladders back. This is 1992, Hart writing about children's participation, again using this ladder, these different stages and these forms of good and bad participation. OECD used the same model, this kind of ladder. Well, I think you've made the point. The problem is that, and this is just in case you were wondering, this is a statue made by a Belgian artist, Jan Fabre. It's called Measuring the Sky. What these ladders are obviously doing is doing the impossible, trying to box in participatory processes, trying to create a distinction between good and bad forms of participation, real and authentic versus manipulated forms. It's a very difficult thing to do in practice, and they don't have that much of a substantive uh, reflection about the struggles about participation itself. So let me try to very briefly introduce this second way of looking at participation. And I'm not going to talk about this model. Uh, it's a book David Held about democratic theory. And what David Held does is write about democracy in plural, models of democracy. There's not one model. There's actually quite a lot of them. The point is partially that this has to do with the history of democracy, but it also has to do with political struggles within the countries, within democracies themselves. These models of democracy are not stable. They're not the same. They're contested. And if we use that kind of logic, there are a couple of things that I can actually explain. First of all, what you always see in democratic models is a balance between representation and participation. And let me translate that. We see a balance between the delegation of power to specific groups in society versus the co-sharing of power of different groups in society. It might actually end up being on the wrong side. Uh, there's one example, actually, uh, an alternative radio station very dear to me in Zurich, uh, which is one of the best examples of participatory culture in the old way. Uh, what is happening right now is a horrible power struggle between two groups in that radio station, which is tearing the radio station apart. This is about excluding one another. Uh, so in every discussion, in every debate, online or in real life, you will find exclusions. But I would like to, again, take this Mufian stand. It's not about whether these people are totally excluded or not, it's whether we define them as enemies or as adversaries. Because if we define them as adversaries, we include them in a way, although we disagree with them. But we still put them within the logics of democracy. And these kinds of re-articulations, uh, they matter. Because once you define somebody who doesn't have the subcultural capital as an idiot that shouldn't be there, you end up in a serious problem, and it stops being a participatory process for me. Uh, but we have to deal with diversity at the same time. We have to deal with the fact that there are different groups. Even in the traditional alternative community radio stations, you have a lot of diversity. And one of the challenges I think we're still facing is learning how to deal with that diversity within the logics of democracy, within the logics of agonism and not antagonism, to use the, the jargon but I won't explain you now. That's for later. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 yeah I, I got control, right? How could I forget? Uh, what's interesting is that you are talking about democracy, but of course you don't think. Uh, we have also regimes. This is a good discussion just on democracy. Because when you don't define some people like enemies, and you include them politically, still doesn't mean that they're not excluded in a more profound way. Okay. 
Well, I think the other part of Well, I, I think that a participatory process, uh, and that's sort of, it goes back to what I, I started with, a participatory process is about equalizing power in differences. It's accepting diversity, it's accepting the adversary, but it's also bringing them in in a balanced position, a balanced power position. And I think these logics are the, the maximalist participatory uh, processes. Now, realizing that in practice is incredibly difficult. It's unstable, by the way. I mean, that's what the, the example of the radio station I just gave also illustrates. And it's extremely difficult to achieve. But I think if we want to achieve this logics of participatory culture, there's no other way. It is about equalizing power relationships. It's not about destroying the other. It's not about destroying mass media professionals. It's about creating new power situations that respects each of these positions. And that is what I would call a participatory culture, but necessarily unstable uh, and always at the risk of 